Um, if it's your first time here, my name is Christopher, uh, one of the pastors here. I get the privilege of, of sharing God's word uh, often, and I love it. And uh, we're going to jump right in. We're in a series kind of working through what it looks like to think about the church. Been doing it for a couple weeks. And just kind of framing our mindset on thinking about the church. What is the church supposed to look like? What's the purpose of it all? Why do we gather? Why do we do what we do? Um, what are we trying to accomplish uh, all of that is what we're trying to answer and uh, at least skim the surface in this series. We want to understand the purpose and the process. What are we trying to do, do together as a local family of Jesus? And so we are wrapping our, our series around this one phrase to kind of explain how we think about church. The phrase is, is simple. Hopefully you would memorize it, but more live it out. The phrase goes like this. We are being formed together by practicing the way of Jesus for the good of our neighbor. There you go, D.Y. Okay, come on, somebody. Come on. I wasn't going to ask that to feel the shame I did last week, but I'll ask it in a week eight. Formed together by practicing the way of Jesus. That's what's happening. God is forming us together by practicing the way of Jesus, and it results in the good of our neighbor. People are blessed. The world is impacted. So the last two weeks, we kind of just took this word by word. And, and what is God's main goal and intention for the Christian life? If we can answer that question, what is God's main goal for your life, then we can put together the answer for what God's main goal for the church is. It's the same thing. And we saw from the scriptures, specifically Romans 8, 28, 29, if you're taking notes, that God's main activity in your life is to shape you and form you into a person who lives and loves and looks like Jesus. Your holiness is his prerogative. Your holiness is his priority. Your holiness, your Christ-likeness is his agenda for your life. Not just your happiness, even though Christ-likeness brings joy. Not just your comfort, even though it brings internal joy. Not just all the other things that are great to have success. christ Likeness. I love, thank you, Krista, again, for sharing and being vulnerable and honest. Uh, that's what Jesus, that's what she's saying Jesus is doing in the midst of even the pain is that he's making me more like him. He, God uses everything to do this, anything and everything to do this, to make you into more like Jesus. So last week, we, we kind of are looking at how this happens. Last week was God's role in doing this. We got to understand this, to understand what's happening here as a body. Last week, we saw what God's part in more, making us more like Jesus was. And then this week, we're looking at our part. It's a participation. It's a joint effort. Last week, we saw two things. One, that God makes us into new people instantly. He changes us overnight as we receive the death and resurrection of Jesus by faith. We're united to Jesus. And so at the moment you put your faith in Christ's work is that moment you are changed into not a better version of you, your, your old self, not an updated version, but a wholly new person. It's called regeneration. Titus 3, you are regenerated. You are born again. You start fresh. That means that when you were born again, my kids, when they were born, they had to grow up into maturity. And so God changes us into an instant where now we have a new heart and we have new desires and we have new uh, habits and new ways of thinking. And then he changes us over a lifetime through the process of sanctification. Day by day, like Krista read in the scripture. Day by day, he changes you overnight in an instant to a new person and then matures you day by day through sanctification. That's his work. He is the primary agent in you changing. He is the primary agent in you changing. If you don't get that down, if you don't get the gospel down, then you're gonna start thinking change happens by just me knuckle, white knuckling it and, and putting my foot down and pulling myself up by the boot stamps and just doing everything I can to hustle, hustle, grind, grind. And you find out sooner or later without the gospel as your foundation that you're just kind of keeping a checklist and a rules and you're not getting anywhere. It's the same way that without the gospel, you can run and work hard on a treadmill, but you don't go anywhere. And that's what it's like when you try to grow yourself without the gospel being the foundation. You end up working a lot, but you don't go anywhere. You don't have traction. So we don't want to just work a lot and not have traction, right? We want real 
traction. Real sinners need real traction. Real people that have brokenness need real change. Not hypothetical change, but real change. So God is doing this in our community. He's forming us together, and God is doing that by saving people. He's doing that by being committed to you changing day by day. Slowly, over time, you add on layers of maturity, and that's his role. But okay, that's the gospel. God changes us through the cross and the resurrection, and then he changes us through suffering, through trials. He Last week, he talked about burning off the dross so that you can end up seeing God can see his reflection in you just like you would for gold to burn off all the impurities. That's what God is doing. He's burning off all the sinful impurities of your life so that as he shapes you, he can see and the world can see his reflection in you. That's what God's commitment to you is. So this week, you're writing notes down. What role do we play in our formation? What role do you and I play in our formation? God grows us, God saves us, God changes us. But how do we, if you, maybe a simpler way to say it is how do we grow? What do we do to grow? We just read the Bible here, we attend church. What do we, does the Bible give us an answer on spiritual growth, on formation? And I want you just to, before we move on, remember, put this, keep this in the context of church. We're thinking about us as a body, right? So God is doing this. So what we're going to talk about is not just your private devotional life. This is how God is going to grow you individually in the same way he ends up doing that corporately as a body. This is how God grows us. And I just have one burden this morning, one reason why maybe you would want to lean in and why we need to unpack this more and not just talk about something else. I have a feeling, and maybe I could be off, but if you're anything like me and what I've felt following Jesus, some of us here today are confused or frustrated with our lack of spiritual growth. Maybe if I had a a survey, if we were honest and raised our hands, we more often than not, in certain seasons, are confused about how do we grow Confused that we're not growing, or maybe the confusion has turned into frustration. We keep feeling like we're hitting brick walls, not making traction, stuck. You ever use the word stagnant? Raise your hand if you ever used the word stagnant to describe your spiritual life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm, I'm trying, but I'm not going anywhere. I, I, I kind of know the right answers, but I'm not making progress. I feel like I keep hitting a brick wall. Like, I'm frustrated at how do I grow and mature And the danger is if you continue to stay in that frustration or confusion, you end up either A, thinking something is wrong with you, or B, something is wrong with God. If you stay in the frustration and don't get clarity on how to grow and what the Bible says about it, you will subtly become frustrated with God. Hey, God, you're not answering my call to grow. Look, I'm showing up. Where are you? Or you're going to be confused about yourself. You start doubting yourself. You think something is wrong with me. Maybe I'm not saved. Maybe I'm not doing it right. Maybe something's wrong. I don't have enough faith. Maybe I'm not holy. And you start looking inner and you become your worst critic. Come on, somebody. Who is their worst critic? Raise your hand if you're your worst critic. Raise it high. Be proud. Don't boast in your sin. I'm my worst critic. I'm the one who criticizes me the most. Not any of you all. Not my enemies. I don't have enemies, whatever. It's me. I'm the one who gets hard on myself because I think something's wrong with myself. So that's why I think we really, truly need a path forward from the Bible, from God's word that shows us how to gain spiritual traction. So here's the outline if you're taking notes. Three three movements we're going to move through to answer this simple question. How do we grow? What's our role in formation. Uh, Number one, a harmful myth. We're going to unpack a a myth that is harmful, that is harming all of us. Number two, a helpful shift. We need just a framework that needs to change a little bit so we can gain some traction. And lastly, we're going to end around a holy call, and we're going to end with communion. A harmful myth, a helpful shift, a holy call. Number one, a harmful myth. It's crazy how often we start living in this Christian life and somehow, naturally, the ways of this world slip right in. The, ha- the habits of this world, the rhythms, the language, the expectations of this world slip right 
And so let me just do something. I want to do a little thought experiment. Let me, let, me, let me paint a familiar scene that maybe you have experienced before. Let's say you wake up tomorrow morning. Moms and dads, this is for the kids, but I, I'll hit other people in a minute. Say you, you wake up tomorrow morning. <clears throat> And you realize, maybe your husband says this to you, maybe your wife says it to you, like, hey, honey, you're being really irritable right now with our kids. Like, they're three years old. They're not going to know how to control their emotions the way you think they need to control their emotions. I'm not saying this because I've ever heard this before in my life or anything like that, but... um, they, they need to control their emotions. So you're irritable. Maybe you said it to your spouse. Hey, you're being irritable to your kids. You're being impatient. You need to slow down and have grace and mercy. Anyone, parent, ever been there before? Irritable to their kids? Okay, so you get that sense of I've been impatient with my kids. And what do you say? What do we say? What do we think? Here's what I have said before. Okay, I'm being irritable. I'm, I'm just going to try to be more patient tomorrow. Okay, wife, husband, I'm being irritable. I'm being impatient. Well, here's the antidote. I'm going to try and just, I'm going to try harder at, at understanding their, their lack of maturity. I'm going to be, be more patient. I'm going to try to be patient tomorrow. Maybe another scenario. Maybe you feel convicted. You hear other people talk about their Bible reading time and their knowledge, and you feel convicted that you're not spending time in the scriptures like you know you should. Not reading like other people. And so what do you say? What do you think? What do you do? Especially around New Year's Eve. What do we do? Okay, I'm going to try really hard to read my Bible every day, every morning. I'm going to try every morning to wake up and read my Bible. I love New Year's. I love the, the fact that I get to straight up erase everything and say, here's my new goals for a fresh start. But every time, without a doubt, every goal I have set that I said, I'm going to try to do this, I end up failing, whether it's three months or three weeks into it. I'm going to try harder to read my Bible. Maybe another scenario, you hear people talking about their prayer life, and you're like, wow, you, sp- you spent all morning praying? Like, you go on prayer walks? I don't know if you've ever heard, there's some people in the church I've heard that they go on prayer walks in the morning or they spend time on their knees in the closet for 30 minutes and you hear that and you say oh that's attractive I know I need that in my life so I'm gonna try and pray for 30 minutes a day anyone ever made that goal before in their life I'm gonna try and pray 30 minutes a day okay I'm gonna I'm gonna do it and and you and you try to do the increase of prayer that you see try to be more patient try to read more of the Bible try to pray 30 minutes a day Two things. Your intentions are good. The intentions to read the Bible more, good, right? The intentions to be patient, the intentions to pray, they are good intentions. You want to grow and obey God and love Him. They are good things. And your resolve is probably strong. You're passionate. When I make those goals, when I say, I'm going to read my Bible every morning, or I'm going to pray for 20 minutes, or I'm going to be patient with my kids, I have a a decision, a, a resolve in my heart to say, I'm going to put effort toward this. You're determined to give it your best shot. So, what ends up usually happening? <laughs> Tuesday morning rolls around and you yell at your kids. Maybe Monday night. Getting up early is uh, sexy in the beginning on Instagram, but when you end up staying late watching Netflix, it gets really hard to wake up early, so you end up dropping the Bible reading time Maybe you get distracted and you pick up your phone because you read your Bible on your phone because it's efficient and then Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or something else or Slack goes off. And so what ends up being, I'm going to try to read the Bible, ends up being, nah, that's too early. Nah, I've got too much work to do. And so maybe a few weeks later, you end up stopping your time. You say, pray, man, I'm going to pray for 30 minutes, and you get into doing that, but then you say, oh, there's no way. I'm not getting any results. God's not really speaking to me, and so 30 minutes is too long. Maybe I got to I gotta start somewhere else, and you end up giving up totally because you don't see the results. You lose focus. It's hard to sit still for some of us. It's crazy how the idea of trying harder seems to always fall flat. The idea of trying harder seems to always fall flat. If you are taking notes, why don't you write this definition down? This is my idea of of what trying harder 
is. This is why it's not working for many of us. Trying, the word trying, the intention in our heart to try to read the Bible, to try to be patient, to try to not look at pornography, to try to serve my kids, to try to give and tithe, to try to be humble. Whatever it is for you, to try not to speed on the highway, to try not to drink caffeine, whatever you are trying to do, try to fast. Trying is a temporary burst of interest and effort. A temporary burst of interest and effort that is guaranteed to wane either over time, in the face of resistance, or due to a lack of results. I'll say it again. Trying is a temporary burst of interest or effort that is guaranteed to wane either over time, in the face of resistance, or due to lack of results. Trying, the heart is good, but sometimes it, we stop trying because it takes too long. Like what we thought was gonna happen is not happening, so it's, oh, I gotta try and do that for that long of a period, so we stop, and it takes too long. Maybe some of us try and then we stop because it's not getting easier. Hey, I've been praying for four weeks and it's still hard. Hey, I'm reading the Bible for, for four months and it's still difficult. So it must be that something is wrong, so I'm going to stop trying. Or lastly, maybe you stop trying because of lack of results. It's not working. I don't see the change. I don't see the revolutionary revival in my heart. I don't see the fruit. I don't see something changing in my marriage. I don't see when I try hard that my kids are responding. I don't see when I try praying that God is speaking. I don't see when I try reading the Bible that God is making himself clear. It's still confusing to me. Trying harder is a harmful myth in the kingdom of God. Trying harder is not the way the Bible paints what it looks like to be a fruitful apprentice of Jesus. Jesus never steps on the scene and say, hey, uh, I want you just to try to follow me. I want you to try and pray. I want you to try and love your enemies. He never says try and do something. Because Jesus knew what we knew, that trying is a temporary burst of interest and effort. You're going to see you wade into the water a little bit, but if it's not, exactly what you think it should be, you're out. And commitment to Jesus is not, not described around trying. It's not realistic. It's not fruitful. And I think if you had to look in your heart, the reason maybe why you are so frustrated, among other things, without even maybe using this language, you have thought that I just need to try harder to do this and it will work. And I hope that helps. Maybe give language. I know it's bad news. We'll get into some good news. But maybe you are stagnant. Maybe you're frustrated. Maybe you're stuck because you're approaching growing in Jesus like trying to lift a weight. And you sit there and you go to this heavy weight and you lift it and you try as hard as you can. And you can try to run a marathon. Come on, somebody. But if you try to run a marathon, what probably happens if you just had, went from a couch to marathon? you fall flat on your face. And so where are we going to get frustrated? That the trying wasn't good enough? That the marathon wasn't right? What, what trying is not the way that Jesus wants you to grow in the kingdom? So with that, that harmful myth, that stopping us from growing, I want you to take that and I want you to, to, to compare it to what we read in 1 Timothy. If a Bible turn to 1 Timothy 4, and I want you to see what Paul's language was. He wasn't talking about trying. He wasn't saying, hey, just pull yourself up from bootstrap, your bootstrap just a little bit more. Just, just try a little bit harder. Exert a little bit more energy. Give a little bit more time. A little bit more passion. He doesn't use the word trying. It's not even a framework. 1 Timothy 4. Let me read it one more time. If it's not trying, then what is it? Starting at verse 6. If you put these things before the brothers, Paul's talking to Timothy, a young pastor. He's training him how to be a pastor. You will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of faith and the good doctrine that you have followed. Look at verse 7. Having nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths, rather, what does that your, your, your Bible say? Train yourself. 
have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. You got to, people were out there getting confused that these things that weren't central doctrine. Hey, rather train yourself for godliness. Verse 8, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Paul doesn't say, hey, I want you to train harder to become more godly. He says, I want you to train, and training is the pathway for godliness. See, the problem with my mind, when it jumps to hearing this, maybe your mind, you're thinking, that's not spiritual, that's really practical. I mean, isn't like this whole thing supposed to be spiritual? Look at what the word train means. So interesting. The word train in the original language is the exact same word that we get gymnasium from. It's gymnazo. It's the word we literally get the gym from. The gym. It means to exert intensely like a pro athlete. It assumes full discipline necessary to be in top working condition. And this is gained, this is very important, only from constant, rigorous training. The way to achieve godliness in Paul's eyes, he says, is gained only from constant, rigorous training. The word gymnazo conveys acquiring proficiency through practice. I love that. Acquiring proficiency through practice. Acquiring a set of skills you need through not trying harder, but practice. We're talking about practice? Practice. Practice. That is a spiritual pathway, the Bible says, to gain traction in being formed to the image of Jesus. See, where training is a temporary burst of effort, tr tr where, where trying is a temporary burst of effort, catch this, training is a commitment to a set of practices for the sake of development. You're committing yourself not to the idea that you're going to succeed. You're committing yourself to the idea that there are these practices that I need to commit to so that I get the desired results. So I am developed so I can be able to do what I'm called to do. No one runs a marathon trying to run a marathon. They run a marathon, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, training like an athlete, doing the same thing over and over and over again until they've built up the necessary skills, developed the necessary habits to effectively run 26.2 miles. It's the repetitive action that teaches our mind, our body, and our heart how to operate. We know that. It's the repetitive things. It's the daily things. It's submitting ourselves under something over a long period of time, and that's why we call them spiritual Disciplines. That's where spiritual disciplines comes from. The word discipline, if you, if you rewind it back to the Greek, is the word gymnazo. To discipline yourself for godliness. To put yourself under this constraint to say, I'm going to lock myself in this training regimen in order to become what God wants me to become. And somehow, through God's blessing and spirit and our participation in training, formation happens. It's never one or the other. Remember last week we talked about if it's all God, you're going to be passive. And if it's all you, you're going to be frustrated and prideful. So we want to have the blend that Philippians talks about where he says, Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you. Work out what God is working in you. He never says God's working you, period, full stop. And he never says work out your salvation, period, full stop. There is a flowing together of what God works in you. We have the privilege to train and work out. If you're taking notes, it'd be helpful probably to write this down. I need to remember this. There are no shortcuts to sanctification. There's no fast passes to fruitfulness. There's no shortcuts to sanctification. Oh, do I, I would love, every time I get a new book, every time January 1st comes around, every time I get a new Bible reading plan, I feel like I'm a new creation in Christ. I feel like I could do all things in Christ who strengthens me. So I get up, I have the vigor and the energy, and I'm thinking this one thing, this plan, this video, this book is going to change and revolutionize my life. And God's like, no, it's not. Why? Because I'm treating it as a shortcut and a fast pass for what God wants to do over a long period of time. Now, God, can God grow you fast? Of course he can. 
but a majority of his growth based on the scriptures, and we'll go to another scripture to see this, is God's idea of growing you is participating in your training regimen. Every athlete, every NBA player, every uh, uh, Olympic medalist has a training regimen. They have certain practices they do over and over again to get to the point where they can compete at that kind of level. Hebrews 5, you want to turn there. This is the last scripture we'll jump into. Hebrews 5, Paul, they think the author is Paul, says this. And he kind of affirms this thought process in a kind of different language. Hebrews 5, verse 12 to 14. You want to write that down. He's talking to a whole bunch of Christians, and he says, hey, you guys are like immature, and you should be on solid food, but you're on milk. You know, when you have a baby, they can't eat solid food at first. They drink milk, and when they grow up, they start eating solid food. You're going to kill your baby if you give them tri-tip. The first week. Stephen Harney would love to give his babies tri-tip the first week. He tried to. <laughs> but um, you got to have milk first going to meat. And this is what Paul says. He says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you. Again, the basic principles of the oracle of God. You should be more mature, but you're not. This is why you need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. Now he gives us a very interesting picture into what mature looks like. He says, but solid food is for the mature. Okay? For those who have their powers of discernment, catch this, if you have a pencil underline this, trained by constant practice. Wow. Those who are mature have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. What are you saying? That word constant is where we get also the word habit from. It's a systematic training by multiple repetitions. The people that went from milk to solid food are the people that started training themselves through a regimen, a repetition, so they matured and leveled up. They practiced following Jesus. That's why we are saying practicing the way of Jesus. It's not trying the way of Jesus. It's not just becoming like Jesus. I, unnaturally or, or casually. It is practice. Practice. Repetitive practice and discipline. It gives the idea of structured training. It's good news and bad news, but your spiritual growth will not be most of the time accidental. On God's part, he's very intentional on what he's bringing you through. And on your part, you get to be very intentional on what you get to grow in. And over time, because they practice discernment, constant practice, unhurried, deep growth through effort, discerning what's good and evil, their muscles of discernment grew from immature childish to mature. So when you look at a saint who's very developed, very mature, very humble, very skilled, skilled in the word of God, has a prayer life that is that what, what you want, what you need to know is that they didn't just stumble upon that prayer life, stumble upon that humility, stumble upon that, that kind of skill or that maturity. They didn't stumble into spiritual growth in Christ-likeness. They trained, they practiced over a long period of time to get to become who they are now today. There was a study done, if you read the book, Malcolm Gladwell uh, wrote a book called Outliers. There was a study done of this famous world-class, world-class, thank you, Nate, for the recommendation, uh, world-class um, music school. And they said in this music school, there are three types of musicians. World-class musicians, pretty good musicians, and then the musicians that would probably go back to teach public school. <laughs> and they did some research, and they found out that all these musicians started playing at age five. They were around 20 when they got to the college. So all of them had 15 years of practice to at least get them to the level of being at that kind of expertise, world-renowned. But what they found out, what separated the world-renowned from the public school teachers was that the public school teachers spent about 4,000 hours in 15 years practicing violin. The people who were pretty good spent around 8,000 hours practicing the violin. You know what the people who were world-renowned spent? 10,000 hours in those 15 years practicing violin to get to a point where they were world-renowned, masterful at their skill. You know what that divides up to? 1.8 hours a day for 15 years of practice got them to the rena renowned world-class level of violinist. 1.8 hours a day of practice for 15 years got them to master 
the violin. And they took, took this 10,000 hour kind of template and went to different kinds of trades and skills and saw this was a natural world for almost most trades and skills, basketball, sports, art. That if you want to be a master, if you want to master a skill, it comes at least 10,000 hours of engagement in that one skill to become someone that's mastered it. Now, let me ask you a question. Because we're not trying to play violin, we're trying to follow Christ. If it takes 1.8 hours a day for 15 years to be a master of violin, how much more practice do you think it takes to mature in Christ? How much more practice, how much more intention, how much more time, how many more years does it take to grow in holiness, to become a gentle person, to fight against the addictions of sin that you've grown up against and unlearn the bad habits of this world? How much time does it take, you think? A lot of us have something that we call a devotional time. And maybe it's 10 minutes for you. Maybe it's an hour. Maybe you don't have a devotional time. But, but on, on average, if you wanted to just say 10,000, it's stuck with a 10,000 hour rule. If you wanted to hit the 10,000 hour mark in practicing the way of Jesus to become a master, not in a prideful way, but to be more like Christ, it would take you 30 minutes a day for 54 years to reach 10,000 hours. And we're so frustrated that we're not growing in the next four weeks or four months or four years of following Jesus. Or maybe not frustrated that we're not growing, frustrated that we're not growing fast enough, frustrated that we're not growing like the other person, frustrated that we're not who we want to become. But ladies and gentlemen, the Bible gives us and science gives us and research and psychology and all of this gives us the reason. It takes time. It takes practice. It takes intention. It is an unhurried growth as we submit to the very ancient and ordinary ways of Jesus. We are changed over time. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel at the movement church. We're not trying to create new systems. We're not trying to create new vision. What we need to do is submit to old ancient pathways and submit to those kind of things for a long period of time so we're formed in a different people. 30 minutes a day. Every day for 54 years. That is why maybe you feel this. The people that are, like, like my, my mentors, the people that I've loved hanging around that have been more, most impactful to me are the people that have walked with Christ the longest. It's not that I can't learn from people younger than me or the same age. It's just that the bottom line is the people that have had the most impact on me are the people that have spent 50, 60 years following Jesus and they have scars to prove it. They have scratches and they have failures and they have testimonies and they have trials and they're burnt a little bit, but they're not jaded. They're joyful. They're not downcast. They're hopeful. They're not critical of the church. They're engaged in the church. Why? Because over a long period of time, through the same practices, they let God form them into Christ. What if the growth you wanted can only come through daily, mundane, repetitive practice. Not trying harder, not grinning your teeth and say, I'm going to give it more effort, but submitting yourself, it, not without effort, but submitting yourself under the practices of disciplines of following Jesus so that God does something to you as you submit to those things. And as you look back, you go, wow, this is where God grew me from. I might not be where I want to be, but over time, because God's committed to your growth, you're going to become someone different than who you were. And that's sanctification. And that's what God is doing in this church, in every church. He is causing us to get close enough to rub up against one another over time, practicing this. Oh, really? Two songs again? Really? Communion, we're going to end with, really, we're going to pray, really, we're going to fast, really, the scripture again. Why? Because it's a training regiment that God has given us, a playbook, that as we engage in that through faith, Christ makes us new. It's not, we, we don't need new things. We don't need a new way to do service. We don't need a new way to pray. We don't need a new Bible reading plan. God has given us a plan, and he's just saying, will you just trust me to be faithful to commit to this, and I'm going to work something in you? Stop looking for the newest gadget and gadget and thing. And If you're looking for this church to be something hip and cool and us trying new things, you might want to look for a different church because I'm not going to promise new things. We're not going to promise, not that we can't be new people, but we don't need new things to be new people. 
Jesus wrote the scriptures 2,000 years ago. He spoke the red letters, and God wrote the scriptures 4,000 years before that, and he gave us a pathway that has been working ever since. It's been working ever since. And so I, because I'm a simple guy, I get overwhelmed. I can't think of adding new things to this. This is enough. This is enough for us to ground ourselves in what does it look like to live like Christ. I love what uh, James K.A. Smith, if you have a pencil, write this down. This book is called You Are What You Love. You Are What You Love. And he takes his idea and baby, and basically breaks it out through a whole book, Christian book. But he says this. Let me read you his the semi-long quote, you know, kind of explain this in better language. He said, education in virtue, virtue being the good habits of Christ, is a kind of formation, a reef training of our dispositions, learning virtue, he says, becoming like Christ is more like practicing scales on the piano than learning music theory. The goal is, in a sense, for your fingers to learn the scales so they can play naturally, as it were. The more that you practice the scales, the more you have to think less about practicing the scales and the more you play the song in front of you. And what he's saying is the more you practice the way of Jesus, the more that becomes less something you have to grind and think through and more that becomes who you are as a person. He goes on to say, acquiring virtue takes practice. Such moral kingdom reflecting dispositions, oh, I love this, are inscribed into your character through rhythms and routines and rituals enacted over and over again that implant in you a disposition to an end that becomes a character trait, a sort of learned second nature, default orientation that you tend toward without thinking about it. He's saying we have moral muscles that are trained in the same way our physical muscles are. You see, when you train your muscles in a certain kind of exercise, over time they get used to the exercise and aware and form to what the exercise needs to accomplish the result it promises. And if you train your fingers on the scales of the piano, like we said, it becomes second nature to you playing. No uh, basketball player, Steph Curry, does not have to because I read somewhere he takes around 2,000 shots every five days. It's a lot of shots, not even including practice, not including games, just on his own time, about 2,000 shots. He's doing, ladies and gentlemen, think about this, Steph Curry right now, best shooter in the universe, is doing exactly, don't argue with me, God will have your way. He will, he will, he's doing exactly today the same thing my son is doing, the same drill, dribbling and shooting. Isn't that more advanced for, for my son? And Isn't that like too, too like, watered down for Steph? No, 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 because you see, Steph did it for so long that it became natural to him. So when he catches the ball and Dikembe Mutombo is about to block his shot with a 10-foot range, he can still make it. Why? Because it's become second nature to him. He trained so long and so hard that it became an instinct. It became an instinct. That's why Dallas Willard says this, a baseball player who expects to excel in the game without adequate exercise of his body is no more ridiculous than the Christian, catch this, who hopes to be able to act in the manner of Christ when put to the test without the appropriate exercise and godly living. I got to read that again. A baseball player who expects to excel in the game without adequate exercise, Spence, you should know this, of his body is no more ridiculous then the Christian who hopes to be able to act in the manner of Christ when put to the test without the appropriate exercise in godly living. He says this, certainly we cannot hope to do his deeds without adopting his form of life. And we cannot adopt his form of life without engaging in his disciplines. So you want to become like Christ when your kid kicks you in the toe and you want to cuss all the cuss words made in every single language. But in that moment, it's too late to act for self-control. You got to have it ingrained in who you are. See, in the moment of trial and temptation, it's almost too late to back out of that. You can, but over time, God has made something in you that will come out of you in the moment when it matters the most. And he's saying in the moment where you need to choose obey or sin, in the moment where you need to choose humility or pride, in the moment where you need to choose worship or take worship, that is going to be decided not now, but in the past, what you did with your life. These ongoing practices make what was once a foreign decision now second nature. And that's why 
me being around people that are older and more humble, they seem like they have a little bit more of an instinctive around being like Christ and having joy and not running with cynicism and not criticizing people and not deflating or bringing down others. Why do they have this instinct, second nature? Man, you remind me, you smell like Jesus because over time for 50 years, they acted like Jesus. They followed the disciplines. And if they fell off the discipline, they got back on because it wasn't about it becoming easier. It was about them seeing a result proven through it. They didn't think, oh, I'm going to do this until it becomes easy. No, I'm going to do this for the whole life so I can become more like Christ. Now, I want to just, and before we kind of wrap up with looking at Jesus, I want you to see this is happening right now in our culture. You are being trained and formed by the culture right now through cultural liturgies and cultural practices. You are, this is happening to you whether you know it or not. Why? Because this is how God created us to be. Think about this. Two fruits maybe in your life or in the world that we can see maybe in your, in, in your personal family. Um, com, cons, consumerism and greed is one fruit and anxiety and worry. So maybe you have one or the other. Consumerism or greed or anxiety or worry. Where does that come from? Besides just the fallen nature, where does the idea of consuming come from? Where does the need for greed come from? Where does the, the, the worry and anxiety come from? I'll tell you what it comes from. It comes from you being trained by constant practice of the culture. You see, your consumerism and greed largely comes through your constant bombardment of advertisement and malls and media that sell you on the vision and the good life that having more is better for you. And we end up, end, up, end up, because of practices, visit Amazon daily. We pass billboards hourly. We see ads every second as we scroll. Let me tell you, don't get it twisted. You are being formed by what you do. What you do does something to you. And so as you scroll and pass through billboards, it's not, oh, look at these non-harmful billboards. No, no, they are doing something in you, ingraining in you a vision, a rival vision of the good life rival to what Jesus would say the good life is. You've been trained to want more. You've been trained to think new is better. You've been trained to think buying is fun. Come on, what would you do if you were in any grade school, high school, and you had a mall? I remember myself going to the mall, not because I was going to buy something, but because it was a communal experience, like an event. So when I was in junior high, we would just go in a group, and we would go to the mall, and we'd see our friends. And I didn't have any money to buy anything, but I was there to experience, because the, the idea of being at this place was almost like a temple. The way it was designed, it was kind of a communal experience. You go in, you can sit down, you can have food, you can have nice couches, you can buy things and feel good about yourself. It's not about transaction, it's about experience. They want you to be sold on the practice of wanting more. Think about anxiety. Where does that come from besides just sin and the fall? The news and the headlines that we are so inundated with, usually 90% bad news and negative fear-based content. We are being trained every time we open the newspaper, every time you open Facebook, every time you open the news, I don't care what news channel you watch, that there is a new disaster, a new danger, a new threat, a new problem. Is there good news? For sure. But what sells is not good news. What sells is the constant danger and brokenness of this world. So whether you know it or not, whether you want to or not, you are being trained to be anxious by the constant practice of being immersed in negative news and fear. We're being formed by the practice of social media, to focus more on current news and controversies than Jesus. What you do does something to you. If you want to see who you are becoming, look at your habits, your rhythms, and your practices. Right now, if you want to see the trajectory of who you will become in 10 years, look no further than your daily habits right now. Because what you are constantly doing every day is going to set you up on an actual trajectory to become that kind of person five years from now. You don't have to look in a crystal ball and say, who am I going to become? What kind of parent? What kind of husband? What kind of wife? What kind of woman? What kind of man? What kind of person am I going to become? It's not a guessing game. Look at your rhythms. Look at your practices. Look at your habits for better or for worse. They are forming you into the person you will become. And Jesus says, I will not allow the culture to form you into that image. It has deformed you. 
And so I'm selling you a different kind of good, a different kind of version of the good life. That is to die equals the gain. To love is the best. To give away is better than getting. I'm going to sell you a different kind of way of living that will form you into a different kind of person. The question is not whether we are being formed, but by whom and into what. The question is whether or not, is not whether you are being formed or not. You are. The question that we all have to wrestle with today is who is forming me and into what kind of person am I being formed into? Who is forming you and into what kind of person are you being formed into? If you don't, it's not self-help, but if you don't like who you've become, irritable, greedy, lustful, whatever it is, you got to look nowhere else than what you've been doing with your life what you've been listening to, what you've been looking at, what you've been a part of, who you're hanging around, they all form you. That's why being around the church is part of formation. Worship is formation. Singing songs every Sunday is formation. It does something to us without us knowing or not. Being around one another in home church is formation. We end up being selfless because we have to serve each other. End up being loving because we have to love each other. Let's, let's bring this home real quick. Just a quick way to put this into the context of Jesus. Remember, we're talking about following Jesus, practicing the way of Jesus. Jesus said this call, follow me and take up my yoke and learn from me. Follow me, get by my side, come by my side and do what I do. Remember about two months ago, about the Unhurried series, we talked about Jesus' invitation wasn't just to go and do a whole bunch of stuff, but do it with him as apprentices. What's the goal of being an apprentice? What's the goal of every single one of us as Christians is to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, so that we end up doing what Jesus does. To be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, so we can do what he does. That's why it's practicing the way of Jesus together. So as we practice and live on his way and live his truth and model after his life, John 14, 6, then we end up becoming like him. There's no shortcuts to your sanctification. And one of the ways that we are formed, just to put this into a, a tangible way, is, is through the sacraments, through the practices, and the people of the church. So let's stand as we take communion. I want us to frame our minds around this practice. We're going to continue worshiping the Lord, and I want us to kind of think through what it looks like to take communion, what it means to be formed by this kind of sacrament. Do we just do this because it's an empty tradition? Do we do it because it's an empty ritual? Like, What does it do? Remember, what we do always does something to you and in you. Coming to church Raising your hands, opening your Bible, praying with people, discipleship. Those things are like stepping into the gym. And as you show up and submit yourselves to the practices of Jesus, he is going to take you on a journey to become like him. Not without effort, but it sure takes way more than just trying. So worship team, you can come up as we wrap up, but I want you to think about communion. We're going to take communion. And I want you to think about three ways that it forms us as we take it. And we're going to be taking it more often from now on. We're going to be making sure that as we do things, and next week, Pastor Spencer will be talking about this, looking into the way of Jesus. Now that we know the practice is the way that we grow, then what is the actual disciplines? What is the actual way of Jesus? What does that actually look like? Now that we have the tangible, this is how we grow But I want three things, three things that is happening to you and our our team is going to serve you communion. So you go up there, they're going to serve it to you. And this is what's happening as we come to the communion table every week. Three things. One, when we come to eat at the same table, because we're sharing one table, all of us, different backgrounds, different kind of styles, different languages, different maybe a little bit theology, different ways of maturity. We're all coming to one table. And as we come to the same table, 
we recognize that we are one body and family. Many members, but one body. Jesus forms us into family as we share from the same table. Number two, we're not going to take communion. We're going to receive communion. Why? Because when you receive communion, you recognize and are being formed into realizing you don't earn salvation. You receive it as a gift. Jesus' body and the blood broken and split for you was not so that you can take it because you're so good, but you receive it because he's so good. You come to the same table because you're one family. You receive it because you don't earn it. It's a gift. And lastly, we come to the broken bread and crushed grapes, recognizing that through death comes life. See how simple practice of communion can form us into our theology in different kind of people. As we do this over and over again, something happens in us. And God forms us in the family. He forms us in the people who live by faith. And he forms us in the people who know that through trials and death comes resurrection life. The daily practice of rehearsing the gospel forms us into people of the kingdom. And so, as we just engage in worship and singing out, I want you to do one thing. Two things, actually. I want you to go back and receive communion. Receive it. Slow down and receive communion. Slow down before you take and eat and drink. Receive and remember what this is doing. You are practicing the way of Jesus by doing what he said to do. Receive communion. He says, every time you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Paul says, every time you take communion, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes back. It's doing something to you. So take it, rec- receive the gift, and then here's what I want you to do, to stretch you, because we're, being, we're practicing the way of Jesus. Grab that communion and go find someone and pray for them. I want you to minister to one another. As we worship, I don't, I don't care what you pray for. I don't know if you, the Lord put something on your heart for them, a word to share or a prayer. If you just want to say, hey, I'm just going to pray for you, that a communion blesses you, informs you as you rehearse and receive the gospel. Whatever kind of prayer you want to pray, don't spend 10 minutes sharing. Just pray the Lord's blessing over each other. Can we do that? We go to the communion table and we do that. Lord, we come and we, we just submit. We just We're just stepping into the gym every day of life, submitting to the practices that you have set up. Nothing revolutionary, nothing crazy new, nothing trendy. They're ancient, but they work because they're from you. God, help me as I lead this church. Help us as we lead this community together and think through what it looks like to be focused and committed to your way, not our way. Your path, not the tradition path. Your path not the cultural path. Deform us from the cultural ways and form us back into your image, God, to be gentle, humble, sacrificial, joyful people who look and live and love like you. Through the mundane, ordinary, daily repetitive practice of following you, you do something miraculous in that. Meet us, Lord. Minister through us by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you receive Jesus' body and blood broken, spilt for you, and then grab someone and bless them and pray for them as we pray.